Hello, everyone. We've sorted out the remaining hardware and software issues, so let's slowly get started. So hello, my name is Andreas Ferber. Uh, most of you know me from talking about ARM boards and the hardware enablement at previous events. Um, today I'm going to talk about a slightly different topic, but I am going to get back to um, ARM in the end of this presentation. Um, I work at SUSE Labs as a project manager responsible for all our products on the ARM architecture. The topic of today's talk is um, LoRa and uh, frequency um, shift keying radio technologies inside the Linux kernel. Um, in particular, um, how I've been um, developing such a new uh, kernel technology um, and in general how to use uh, not just ARM boards but like anything really connected to such ARM boards. At um, last year's event and possibly before that, I've been speaking about the three dimensions that we've been working on. So for one, um, ARM from time to time has been adding new CPU cores, other vendors obviously as well. Then for a given CPU core, there may be one or more companies actually implementing um, physical chips with that. Um, so that is kind of a one-to-n relationship between the cores to the socks. Um, and then finally, for a given chip, that people can actually buy through their distributors or from the companies directly. There will be any number of boards with um, varying number of connectors, additional chipsets on there and expansion possibilities. Now that is the scope that we have been previously working on and we were usually pretty happy once we actually had the board booting up into OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and have a prompt and have all the packages in place to be able to reproduce that. But at that point, well, it's slightly boring because you have a Tumbleweed system as you have pretty much anywhere else. So the real value actually comes when you make use of the um, interfaces that those boards are offering that you would normally not have on you know, any random notebook or other devices um, that um, you may be familiar with. Now, the big question is, the hardware has been out there for you to purchase for quite a long time. How do we actually use this in OpenSUSE? I will be diving first into this generally and then going specifically into those uh, radio chipsets. Um, in general, um, there are two different types of um, um, how the hardware represents um, itself to the Linux kernel. Um, one is ACPI, as we have on all um, Intel machines virtually. The other one is the so-called device tree, which is a tree hierarchical representation um, of data that is then read by the kernel in order to uh, make decisions about what drivers to load and uh, what specific settings to apply. Um, the so-called DTB, so, um, those device trees get compiled into a so-called device tree blob, that is in short the DTB and the device tree overlay is then like a diff that you apply to um, this base set of information um, on top in order to customize it um, to your needs. Now on the Raspberry Pi this is fairly easy and kind of well documented in that there is um, a text configuration file. Um, on OpenSUSE, this will be extra config.txt because config.txt is provided by our packages and may actually get changed on updates of the packages provided by OpenSUSE. In those text config files, you can add a line um, called DT overlay and then specify the file name of the overlay that you actually wanted to apply on top of the overlay that it, uh, on top of the device tree that it will be using in the first place um, i've run into a slightly odd limitation that nothing will warn about so if something goes wrong there there's no error it will still boot it will just not have those um, settings applied um, the file name needs to be sufficiently short so that with this um, prefix notation or any parameters that you may want to add at the end of the line, um, it is not longer than um, about 80 characters. 
Once all those things um, are um, applied, so either you can write it directly onto the SD card. If you already have a Tumbleweed system booting on that system, you can edit that within the system. Then you need to reboot in order for them to take um, effect. And you will see in the um, proc device tree file system whether the um, properties have changed in the way that you have um, told it to, and obviously check whether um, the drivers have been loaded by the kernel. That is one way that unfortunately is specific to um, that family of boards. Now, um, even on the Raspberry Pi, we are using the U-boot bootloader as a second stage bootloader, or third stage, depending on how you count. Um, and um, by default, there is a so-called distribute mechanism that will iterate over the available boot devices, check for what files are available on those boot devices in that particular order, and then um, normally, and because we have the um, EFI-enabled Grub bootloader on our media, it will load Grub. However, this can be preempted by having a boot.scr file on there. That's a um, text script file converted with a binary header. Um, that contains command that would then be executed either before or instead of the commands that um, it would do by default. So that is uh, one um, possibility to simply duplicate the relevant commands that uh, you need for booting. That is, in particular, um, loading the kernel, loading the device tree, loading the init RD, um, and then specifying a command to um, start executing it. Um, and then, before actually executing it, you can, in that script, um, insert additional commands that it would not execute by default. So for one, um, normally we would just be passing um, a variable containing an address to the boot command. For 64-bit ARM, that would be the boot I command. For 32-bit ARM, usually the boot Z command. Um, in this case, if we want to actually mess with that device tree, we need to first tell it what the address of the device tree is before actually booting. That is the FDT adder command as an address. And then afterwards, um, we can do any things um, with further FDT commands. In particular, we can load additional DTBO files into memory and then apply them to the base DTB file um, with this FDT um, apply command down there. So one thing to be aware of is that the behavior is vastly different from the Raspberry Pi in that if anything goes wrong, like if the um, syntax is wrong or it doesn't find what you actually want to do there, uh, this will break and the base um, device tree will be in an unusable shape. So you'll need to start from scratch or reboot whatever um, you're doing in your particular setup. Once the script has been compiled and is in, compl uh, is in place, you can simply reboot the board, and those settings uh, will start to take effect. And you can, again, check in the running system whether everything is the way um, um, you wanted it to look, and, if necessary, um, iterate on what exactly it's been doing. Now, if all else fails, for example, because you have a Tiana Core EDK2 as a bootloader instead of U-boot, or because you have a very ancient U-boot that does not have those FTT commands enabled, as a last resort, pretty much, um, it is possible to specify a device tree with grub. There is a device tree command that can be used to specify such a DTB file. However, this is not an overlay file. So this is really the device tree that Linux will be using directly. So for one, um, the bootloader always has an opportunity to modify any device tree that it uses um, as an input. Um, for example, it can use a random number generator in order to generate an offset to use for um, kernel address space layout randomization. Um, if you provided a fixed DTB, then you are in control of what exactly the kernel will see and nothing else uh, will change after that. So um, it becomes your responsibility to uh, make sure that this um, DTB file is in a sane shape. Um, custom CFG is a very convenient way to um, have those um, additional grub commands be integrated into our regular ZUSE um, boot flows in that um, 
you can just run the config and Zuzu will take care of all the YAS tools and Grub tools will take care of generating a menu with the various kernel versions that you have installed. And um, for example, before um, or after that menu, um, it would just be executing um, any commands that you've specified um, this way. Obviously, one handy thing that I always do is also insert an echo to actually make sure that it is doing what I want when I want. Yes. And I've been talking about um, a lot what you do with the DTBO or DTB file. How do you actually get those files? For one, um, the Raspberry Pi comes with a number of um, pre-generated DTBO files for certain um, frequently used um, expansion boards. Um, but it is also very easy to write this on your own with a simple text syntax. Um, the main things that you will need to do um, for any given node, be it you know, a spy node, I2C, um, UART, um, PWM, whatever it is, in the end is that you need to make sure that the specific function you want to use is actually enabled. You do that by overriding the status property. Um, and in some cases, it may be necessary to assure that also the so-called pin control configuration is set. That means switching between whether the physical pin is actually going to be um, just an input-output or whether it has a special function like, for example, um, those mentioned here, uh, spy, UART, whatever exactly. Once you have the driver um, enabled, the second task is to make a driver-specific node addition to there. So if you have a serial port, you can directly, um, via the serial device bus, um, attach drivers to um, interface with um, the UART. Or obviously, um, for spy nodes, um, you can have just regular spy drivers that um, are interfacing with the hardware registers and transfers directly. And again, um, it depends on the individual driver, what exactly needs to be specified there. Usually there is documentation for my new stuff, uh, and that is something we're still working on, but um, usually examples are available that can be copied from. Now, to the actual project. Um, at some point, you will have, on the one hand, um, your board running our Linux, and on the other hand, some random chipset. So for example, this is a clickboard that implements the uh, LoRaWAN radio standard. And the question is, if you have the hardware and you have the board, you might have either a connector or there's various adapters available, for example, to go from um, Raspberry Pi 40 pin pinout to um, Arduino pinout or um, this click um, pinout, microbus pinout, sorry, um, or XB or any number of um, vendor-specific um, variants. And the big question is, how can you then make use of this hardware? This. Before I get to the details of that, I'll be talking a bit more about variants of the um, LoRa radio modules. So um, um, this one that I was just holding up over here um, is the middle variant where you have a small microcontroller on board of the um, expansion board. Um, this is then driving the actual radio communication and you are communicating, um, in this case, via a UART. Um, and it is up to that microcontroller firmware provided by the vendor to determine how exactly you speak um, to that particular module. Um, the reason that many vendors do this is because it allows them to certify the firmware that they've developed and afterwards you can use that in various regulatory region of the world um, and um, you know, not have to deal with that yourself. Um, whereas like the original class of devices that I was starting with have the actual chipset directly on the board without any additional microcontroller. Um, and that means that in many cases it's going to be the um, serial peripheral interface um, or um, UARTs. In some cases, it might even be um, via a USB connection, be it be USB SPI um, or USB UART. Um, and um, for that, um, 
it will be exposing directly the full features of the physical layer of the radio communication. So that means you can send out various packets, but if you want to have a specific protocol like LoRaWAN, then you need to have a so-called software Mac, um, medium access control um, layer driver, um, that is implementing the actual um, packet frames and structure of that particular protocol that you want to drive and any addressing um, related functionality. Um, finally, what you can see on the very right in gray is that there are also other modules that you will find that are outside of this category that we can use with Linux in that they are actually meant to um, have the user install custom firmware on a microcontroller and usually on those microcontrollers there is insufficient RAM to actually run um, Linux. Now, how to interface. This is trying to depict various subsystems of the Linux kernel. Um, so like, you know, uh, memory management, scheduling, and so on and so on. And then you have certain technology-specific subsystems, like, for example, SPY, TTY, and USB, where you have certain um, generic drivers that will allow you to um, expose, so that will expose a device to user space, allowing you from user space um, to then access via the standard syscalls and, well, GLPC um, provided operations with those devices. Um, in particular, what you will find a lot is like GitHub projects that will be using SpyDev in order to um, send and receive messages via the Spy bus, as well as what most of you will probably know is if you have like a serial console um, or a, you know, other UART um, connected devices connected, you will have some form of TTY device um, that you can then um, access to via those commands and, you know, write from random user space programs. What I've been working on instead is to have drivers inside the Linux kernel that will abstract those vendor-specific interfaces. So just like you have an ETH0 device or whatever it may be obscured depending on the system configuration, um, you will have network interfaces that expose and that allow you to create a socket, which in turn will be using buffers um, to uh, manage and move around packets, both outgoing and incoming. Um, and um, provide an interface that is specific to this radio technology as opposed to one of those many particular chipsets for that technology. On the software side, those socket layers um, then, as the current state of um, discussion and implementation, uh, would be using the um, PF packet protocol family um, on, down on the left side over here um, to um, send raw LoRa packets, which allows you to send data from one board to another board, you know, just send and receive arbitrary data in any way that um, you want to format it. Um, and um, as an alternative besides that, um, there has been work ongoing on developing such a soft Mac for LoRaWAN as a module that would then be translating from a higher level packet family LoRaWAN um, with two different modes in that case. Um, either directly to hardware-specific um, command interfaces um, like AT commands or other forms of communication or to translate that to the existing lower driver stack um, on the lower layer. Similarly, um, um, just like you have the config 802.11 module for Wi-Fi, um, there is a config LoRa module in the works um, which allows you to set certain um, configuration details by exposing an, a Netlink LoRa interface, such as, for example, setting the frequency, getting the frequency, setting the spreading factor, bandwidth, other aspects of the technology. Um, this is being worked on at the moment. Um, and the idea is to have the same thing also for LoRaWAN, so that on top you have an abstract layer that is uh, modeling things like um, data rates and um, configurations on this higher level that will then translate directly to um, either the hardware Mac layer over here or to the existing um, NLORA interface um, for the um, soft Mac chipsets. What can you do with that? Well, you can, as the user, directly use 
um, the um, LoRa interface to send whatever packages you want peer-to-peer. -peer. There's also some proprietary um, protocols that someone could theoretically um, implement, but that we cannot implement ourselves as a GPL implementation. Um, LoRa 1 was already mentioned. Um, on top of LoRa 1, you can drive, again, all kinds of um, payloads yourself. But um, most of the LoRa chipsets also um, expose an FSK uh, modulation. Um, that's a different kind of uh, transmitting the data. So um, basically, you have uh, amplitude, frequency, and um, phase as the three um, axes that you can modulate data on or combinations of them. Um, LoRa um, chipsets by Zemtech expose both as um, alternatively configured modes. Um, there is a large range of uh, protocols that are based on FSK, some in the um, home automation sector, for example. Um, yeah, you can read some of those names here. I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, BLE, um, depending on which frequency spectrum we're thinking on, so um, LoRa usually is being used in the sub-gigahertz spectrum, but um, FSK can also be used in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, for in instance. Um, that's where Bluetooth Low Energy um, is located, and there is actually um, some chipsets that um, have like three of those modes um, implemented in one module, um, as well as a number of uh, not um, GPL or at least either not documented or not legally implementable as GPL technologies that are listed here, um, as well as OOK is um, an amplitude-based, um, very simple um, modulation, and in the 2.4 gigahertz um, lower chipset, there's also what they call the um, fast long-range coding as an additional uh, modulation technology. Netlink operations. Um, could use people that either propose interfaces or actually implement them. That is something that um, has been worked on in, well, a number of the last weeks since the uh, NetDev conference. So um, for the generic interface as well as one particular chipset, it usually takes, um, well, one night to implement one or two of those operations just for one chipset, and there's many more um, that are in the work. So over time, we'll need to complete the existing driver implementations or add new implementations for whatever chipset it is that you have access to. Um, in order to make use of the drivers for various boards and combination of boards, adapters, expansion boards, and chipsets, one always needs those DT snippets. Um, in theory, um, yes, ACPI is another technology that um, could be used, but that currently um, is not implemented. Um, testing is always needed over time to catch errors. Um, we have open design discussion on how to actually do things where decisions need to be taken. And in some cases, testing has resulted in entirely unrelated problems in the kernel that simply have become um, hurdles. Like, for example, that the clock driver interface simply locks up when called from certain um, um, operations on platforms, but not on all, so that it wasn't initially noticed. So um, increasing that base um, will certainly be a good thing. There is a new uh, mailing list available for this, Linux LP1 on InfraDead. There is also a LoRa ISC channel available. Um, and there are previous um, presentations um, of mine with um, more details on the technical implementation and any particular open issues. And feel free to catch me um, after this talk or um, later during the conference for more detailed discussions. Now, moving on to how this has actually been developed. In general, um, these are basically the choices that people have if you want to develop a new kernel driver. For one, you can always just get the original Linux Git checkout, um, compile it on an ARM board or cross-compile it on your Intel machine, deploy it some way by you know, copying over the files to that um, system. The alternative is to take the um, kernel source Git repository that we are using to build the distro kernels. You could, in theory, throw a couple of patches into there and have them built by the OBS infrastructure. Then you have a package that you can just easily install 
but you know, fiddling that in each time is going to be work that so far I have not engaged in. And then a third option that I have been using extensively is that um, in addition to the kernel default or kernel LPAE kernels that we are building for the distro, there are actually accompanying um, kernel default devel packages and a kernel devel package um, that includes all the intermediate uh, binary files and headers needed for kernel development on that particular board um, with our kernel sources. And you can then use that um, to build modules um, locally um, on that system and simply insert them into the kernel. It will show a taint message, but well, what do we care? Um, the alternative would be to um, put this into a spec file again, you know, package one big or multiple patches, apply them to sources, and then build a KMP package in OBS, and again, install such a KMP package in addition to the kernel package um, that you already have installed. In my case, um, I had a number of ARM, also MIPS boards, and other architectures um, around, and um, depending on the board, obviously, we don't have a, a MIPS distribution for um, for OpenSUSE, so there I've been just cross-compiling an um, upstream kernel and testing that directly for the ARM boards, um, the approach that uh, I was just mentioning. Um, for that purpose, there is a GitHub repository of mine that has a make file, and this make file automates if you just run a make, um, reading out the current kernel version, using that particular um, directory that uh, we have um, in order to um, build the local tree of uh, kernel modules against that. Um, the current requirement is it needs to be a kernel 420 or newer, so it doesn't work with leap, only with release and tumbleweed. Um, and then, yes, there is a kernel org repository with um, some um, already posted patches staged for um, LoRa drivers as well as um, FSK. There's sometimes um, I'm ahead of myself and have a queue of new things in my private GitHub repository that I still need to send out. And um, all those boards um, then have basically the same drivers um, installed, and I can then use one of those boards in order to send via one of those interfaces and try to receive that data on the other boards. Um, and currently that is being done by using debug output from the kernel um, on those boards um, since the receive path on most of the drivers um, is not yet fully implemented. So, um, a number of people helped make this happen. Um, Ben Witten from uh, company Laird, they do gateways, has been contributing to the SX1301 um, Linux driver, as well as um, some volunteers in um, Taiwan, um, John Hong Pan, and in, um, um, as well as several others um, in, in Germany, um, and a number of, sorry, <laughs> that was here the uh, company I was just talking about and um, a number of other vendors have helped us out in providing hardware um, to allow for a broader testing of those drivers and creating more drivers and finding an abstract interface that uh, fits all those various vendor-specific um, interfaces. Um, so thank you again to those people who have made that happen. And uh, if you have hardware from companies that is not listed here, just uh, let me know or talk to those companies whether they may be um, willing and interested to participate as well. Having talked a lot about ARM boards already, I'll be giving a couple um, updates as a bonus here. So for one, um, Torsten Duver has been working on the Olimex Terrace 1 um, notebook. Um, that's a notebook kit that you assemble um, yourself based on the Allwinner A64 um, system on chip. Um, he has been actively working on upstreaming U-boot support for this board so that we have the regular OpenSUSE um, tumbleweed workflow working on that one. Um, in addition, the, please, so this is Torsten Duve here. Can we have a round of applause for him, please? So, so looks like a notebook, behaves like a notebook. This is it. And as you can see, it is running Linux 
I just updated the regular way to, from 15.0 to 15.1. It's running a custom kernel, although I'm currently in the process of pushing the final patch series upstream, but otherwise it's an upstream 5.2 kernel and regular uh, ARM64 uh, opens with a leap 15.1 running there. I would assume that in 15.1, probably the network drivers or something would be lacking. Oh, what do you need the custom kernel for? Um, it's only the EDP bridge for the internal display. I mean, if you read kernel, uh, the kernel mailing list, it's that series that we're currently uh, discussing, and that's the final thing for, for growth support. Um, a Bluetooth and HDMI have minor issues, otherwise it should be fully supported right now. Uh, what, whichever, if, if people, are, you can keep it there and people look at, look at it afterwards. I don't care. And if you're interested, find Torsten after the talk. Um, he may be able to share some experiences in case maybe you have a slightly different variant of a device that you would want to uh, make um, open source run on. Um, we've been running the Pine64 for quite a long time already. Um, now also the Banana Pi A64 has been getting some testing and packaging. Um, same chipset that is, and then for the all winner H6 um, SOC, um, the Pine H64 has started slowly to work. Um, so, since the 5.0 kernel, I think also the uh, network on that one is working. Um, however, I've noticed that um, despite having a Raspberry Pi compatible connector, there are some limitations compared to the Pine 64 in that not all pins can actually be used with the other connectors on the board at the same time, in particular UART and Ethernet I'm aware of. Okay, NXP Core IQ. Um, there has been a um, Freedom LS 1020A, 10, sorry, LS 1012A um, board um, with rather limited uh, resources um, that uh, we've been having difficulties actually getting OpenSUSE to run on. Um, then there was a free, new freeway board with some additional um, connectors and connection possibilities. For example, a connector to connect this, in theory at least. Um, Unfortunately, U-Boot for that is not upstream, and it's been, uh, I've not been able to modify the U-Boot environment to actually circumvent that. So um, it really needs to, uh, me to stop the boot um, on the uh, burst and manually um, type or um, paste in commands in order to boot into our kernel. But so far, it's been working. Unfortunately, the upstreaming of that was never completed by NXP, so the whole network complex is working, which impacts the use of the... Um, UART connections that are behind a spy bridge on that microbus connector. So unfortunately, again, it can be used for, may be able to use for spy, but not for UART. Um, so yeah, um, your mileage may vary, as they say. The new kit on the block is the NXP IMX 8M um, chipset. So two uh, community-ish boards have surfaced for that. One is the PicoPi, the other one is the Coral board from Google. Um, on those boards, NXP has been shipping a slightly outdated version of U-Boot. It does already um, have the support for booting EFI. Um, it's not being used via the distribute setup, unfortunately. Um, so it is possible to manually interrupt the boot and run those commands. However, then Grub will not find its uh, config because the U-Boot still has some bugs because it's um, not current. Um, and uh, yeah, um, apparently no one has been working on those new boards yet to make sure that an upstream um, bootloader is available that would um, fix those particular problems. I had um, started the upstreaming for um, action semiconductor boards, in particular the Bubblegum 96 board, as well as um, a few others mentioned here. Um, I've been getting some help, um, making progress with the drivers. Unfortunately, those activities have ceased for the moment. Um, so we're still on have like an SD card driver that we could really load a rootfs from. Um, there is a U-boot available, but beware that for one of those boards, but beware that it does not have the full set of drivers. So it's not really that useful yet. Um, but if you're interested in it, there is now a Linux Actions a mailing list on InfraDead that you can join um, if you're interested in those particular um, chipsets. 
Um, similar with Realtek, unfortunately there have been some problems with the interrupt controller for quite a long time and time issues on my side. So there is not much progress on that. Um, some people have showed interest um, to um, help out with that topic and there is a Linux Realtek SOC mailing list also on InfraDead um, that can be used to coordinate efforts between volunteers. NVIDIA has, uh, with much fanfare, um, introduced a new Jetson board. Unfortunately, it is, well, what, not unfortunately, the uh, fact is that it is using like the, an older generation of the Tegra chip, the X1. We had already successfully tested the um, Trusted Firmware and U-Boot um, for that particular chipset, so hopefully that should be fine. If anyone has one and can provide feedback, that would be appreciated. Looking at certain people in the front here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I've made the experience for the, um, X, so the X1 generation. Um, things have been working okay with flashing things onto those boards for me, um, but um, since upgrading to Leap 15.0, um, I've been unable to actually get anything onto the X2 board. So um, that remains to be retested with 15.1. Um, and similar story with Rockchip, so there are some uh, new boards that have surfaced and we've also prepared some packages um, for those. Unfortunately, I've not been able to test them because similarly the USB flashing tool for that one is broken in current 15.0 and needs to be tested whether um, anyone has come up with any fixes or workaround for that one. Finally, um, since I've spoken about ARM so much, not been able to you know, speak much about other architectures. Um, we've not been seeing uh, much presentations here about RISC V, so I've taken the opportunity to say a few words about that one as well. So for one, um, if you have QMU packages installed on OpenSUSE on whatever system you have, you can emulate a RISC V system. Um, there are now U-Boot packages available that can be um, used with that. U-Boot packages are now also available for the currently single available um, hardware um, Linux compatible board for us 5 the Hi5 Unleashed. Um, unfortunately, either way, um, Grub support for RISC-V is still missing, at least in our package, possibly also upstream. Um, so, um, yeah, some things still need to happen to have a easy user experience there, but it's already use, um, possible to use it. Andreas Schwab has been spending a lot of time uh, working on this, and um, you probably already know that for the ARM architecture, you can find all the various packages in the OpenSUSE Factory ARM um, project, and similarly, there is an OpenSUSE Factory RISC-V project that is building um, for this new architecture. That is it. We do still have roughly five minutes for questions. Anything about LoRa or ARM boards and hardware attachment in general? Heiko, any updates that you may want to share for Rockchip? No. Yeah, in the back. Um, Peter, please go ahead. Is it possible to swap, disable the Bluetooth on the Raspberry Pi 3 and use the hardware you are instead from an OpenSUSE image yet? Mm, not on the regular Raspberry Pi. So um, the pins of the, well, what is being used for the Bluetooth UART um, are not being exposed on the board in any way that I know of being able to at least easily access them. Um, so you have only one UART that is being exposed there and via a DT overlay you can switch whether that is the TTYS0 or the TTYAMA0. If, however, you use the Raspberry Pi compute module with some baseboard that does not have um, Bluetooth chipsets uh, on there, um, then you can actually use both. And we've been, um, Matthias over here has been working on a device tree overlay that can be used to um, enable that second UART because apparently that is not being done by default. Yeah. Oh yes, so um, 
we've been working with a company called um, Embedded Microtechnology in the UK. They have a, a baseboard called MyPi um, that you can, you know, um, plug this dim-shaped um, um, compute module into and then have like pretty much the same or possibly even well, about the, the same on even more connectors than you would have on the Raspberry Pi in a rather, well, larger shape. Um, so that, and then also has um, their own um, expansion mechanism for having, like, um, industrial-grade um, I.O. with, you know, like, higher voltage levels than you would usually have on the Pi. Um, and, yeah, that is one way to get around certain limitations of the Raspberry Pi, um, you know, three Model B, B plus boards. Any further questions? Okay, then, th thank you very much for your interest. Oh, yes, um, what I had been standing here on the board is two more things to show. So, um, I was speaking about adapters from one type of expansion board to another. For example, this one is um, matching from the 96 boards, uh, where it was previously pretty difficult to attach anything because they have um, smaller um, pitch of only two millimeters instead of the 0 0.1 inch um, and uh, 1.8 volt instead of 3.3 volts. So this goes from that particular output to Raspberry Pi and um, Arduino connectors. Um, it's still slightly difficult since this is an um, early adapter to make use of it, so it needs some configuration. Um, on the system to choose um, how the pins are actually going to be routed. And since it has an uh, FPGA on board, um, it costs about as much as the uh, uh, cheapest 96 board. Um, other adapters for going from Raspberry Pi to, um, you know, the smaller microbus connectors, that's probably around, I don't know, 15, 20 euro. Um, and, yeah depending on whether any additional chipsets are on such an adapter, you know, the price will, will vary and the size of it, of course. The other thing um, I brought here is something that I already showed at the OpenSUSE booth at uh, Fostem. This is essentially a Raspberry Pi. I actually opened that uh, last time and showed the inside since I exchanged the Raspberry Pi um, there to be 64-bit. Um, you can see, you know, the connectors of that here on the outside that you may recognize. Um, and on top of the Raspberry Pi, it then has like a custom designed um, adapter to go to a um, particular LoRa module there. And um, they've designed, you know, a um, aluminum case around that and are basically selling that as a product. And you will find that quite a lot if you look around that people are actually taking the um, standard SPCs and then, you know, making some waterproof case that is much larger possibly um, than the actual board around that um, and selling that as, um, you know, gateway devices that are then put up on rooftops or somewhere on the wall.